we're anticipating um, Dr. Fraser Kwasi, go ahead. Yeah, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Texas Juvenile Crime Prevention Spring Speakers Series. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today, uh, despite the winter storm, uh, both here and in Chicago, Mr. Curtis Toller, who is um, coming to us from Chicago and very fittingly fits in with the center's mission and mandate to look at youth violence, uh, youth crime and preventing crime and delinquency. So I very pleased, I'm Susan Frazier Kwasi, the director of the Texas Juvenile Crime Prevention Center. And uh, we will have words from Dr. Camille Gibson, who is executive director of the center. Good day, everyone. Uh, the Texas Juvenile Crime Prevention Center has been in existence for a few decades. And our mission as part of a land grant university at Prairie View a and in Texas is to be responsive to issues that are going on in the community that affect children and families. And so this is the second installment of this year's speaker series and the focus is on the increase in violence that we see in many pockets of urban communities, especially in the past few years. And so we are delighted to have someone who knows quite a bit about what works and what doesn't work when it comes to dealing with urban violence. So Mr. Curtis Toller. Mr. Curtis Emir Toller is a Chicago native who has uh, a background in gang involvement. He is currently the director of Outreach for Chicago Cred. This is after his experience in gang life in Chicago. He's committed to impacting a culture of violence in Chicago by connecting at-risk young men with chances to reset their lives through job training and employment opportunities. He has experience as a gang intervention specialist and has been a spokesperson for the peacemakers at the faith community of St. Sabina Church. He worked as a lead trainer and community liaison for the National Center for Violence Interruption and as an outreach supervisor at Cease Fire. He's been a coach for the Chicago Peace Basketball League and a member of the Community Justice Task Force and a Chicago gang historian. He has been recognized by the State of Illinois Senate for his commitment to improving the quality of life in the community. He's been a lecturer, a motivational speaker around issues of violence in schools, university communities, and various other settings. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Curtis Toller. And you can do hand emojis. <laughs> okay, so we have a serious topic. We are located just outside of Houston, Texas, where we've seen an increase in violence, especially over the past two years. This has not been our worst year for violence. Our worst year for violence was in 1981, where the homicide rate was almost twice what it is today. But Granted, we've seen a significant increase in the Houston area, up 18% from one year to the other. Last year, I'm sorry, year before last, 2020, 405 homicides. Last year, at least 473 homicides. And uh, we're not just talking about numbers because people are often moving to this area, but we're talking about the rates. We've also been involved in uh, responding to the Dallas community, which recently has seen some success. 
But as we get into this conversation today, and we'll hear from Mr. Toller, and then uh, as time permits, we'll have some questions. Um, so first of all, if you would tell us who is Curtis Toller? Oh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, who is Curtis Toller? Well, first of all, I'm a husband. I'm a father, I'm a friend. I believe that friendship is essential to the soul. Uh, I'm a spiritual being. I'm a mentor, a change agent. And beyond all of that, I'm just a kid from Chicago. Um, and also, I'm a work in progress. So that's who Curtis Toller is. Okay. Um... Tell us about how a young Curtis Toller got involved in Chicago gang life. I'm what you would consider a legacy gang member. Uh, my grandfather, ironically, was a part of a gang. Uh, my father was a founding member of one of the gangs here in Chicago. And then I myself, uh, I was initiated into gang life probably at nine, going on 10 years old. Um, I was impacted by a lot of uh, drama and trauma uh, in my home life, uh, physical and verbal abuse. Um, and then I began to be bullied while I was in school. So that was really how Curtis Toller really got involved uh, in, in the gang life. Um, my mom, okay. we moved, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, go ahead. Continue. Yeah, my mom, my mom, she moved around a lot in Chicago. And so we moved uh, to the south side of Chicago and she married um, my stepdad. Um, and he was a really big guy. He was heavily uh, into weightlifting and he had been incarcerated himself. <clears throat> and again, you know, suffering from a lot of verbal and physical abuse at the hands of him and watching him uh, abuse my mom, I would leave the house often. And so I just happened to, to ride a bike uh, past the facility, and I saw another another big guy. He just happened to be Jeff Ford. Uh, and the first thing that went through my mind is that here's a guy who's just as big as my stepdad could defeat my stepdad. So I joined the L. Rukin at probably the age of 14. Um, then most of those guys, uh, unfortunately, were locked up for domestic terrorism against the United States of America, which left me and a group of younger guys out to really fend for ourselves. And then um, I kind of started uh, rising up in, in that gang life. Um, there were several attempts on my life. I was shot in the head once. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, unfortunately, my mom died at the hands of my stepfather to domestic, domestic abuse and domestic violence. Um, I was one of the youngest people that was incarcerated at Stateville Maximum Penitentiary. I came home as one of the leaders of the Black Peace Dome. Oh, wow. So the gang that you joined was a different gang from the one that your father was in? Yeah. Was <laughs> so it was, it was an alliance. So in Chicago, they have gang alliances, which you have all of these gangs that, you know, that are part of, of you have subgroups that were a part of a bigger group, but we were, the gang was part of that same group, but it was a different, a different organization. Okay, very interesting. Okay, so tell us about your realization that gang life was not the thing for you. How did that happen? Um, it was a number of things that happened and we call them like transition points. I think my first transition point uh, was when I used to uh, ride the bus. We have uh, buses here, the CTA bus here in Chicago. And I would get on the back of the bus with, with some of my gang members and we would cause havoc. And I can remember an older gentleman pulling me to the side on the bus and having a conversation. And he was, and he just said these things. He was like, you know that, you know, some folks have lost their, lost their lives for us to not only sit on the front of the bus, but not to disrespect people. And that was one of the first, if you will, uh, seeds that were planted, you know, for me to start thinking differently. And then we can move fast forward. When my son was born, I actually thought that he was coming to replace me because he looked so much like me. And I also was involved in so many conflicts and so much gang violence at that particular time 
that I yeah, that I did think that he was coming to actually take my place. Um, I had moved away from a lot of the violence and became more mainstream in what we call the drug trade here in Chicago. Um, I thought that I was going to be incarcerated again because a lot of my friends and the people that I was dealing with at that time were actually being indicted. Um, and so I made that, uh, that foxhole prayer that a lot of us make, oh God, if you just give me one more chance, I'll do something different this time. And I was actually sincere with that. Uh, and my son was graduating probably from the fourth or fifth grade and he was singing a song um, by a group called Chicago. You're the meaning in my life. You're the inspiration. And it kind of went directly to my heart that particular time. And right then and there, I knew that I wanted to do something different. Very, very, very interesting. Um, Dr. Dr. Gibson, this is Susan. Yes. Um, do you mind if I interrupt? We have a question that uh, it's relevant to what Mr. Toller is talking about. Sure. I can, can I pose it to him? Okay. So you talked about transition points um, in the gang life. Uh, the question is, what strategies assist in breaking the cycle of legacy gangs in urban and rural areas? <laughs> well, there are several different strategies. I think that first, that we have to first deal with what I call the internal conflict, right? And the internal conflict is whatever traumas that that are in, encouraging you to act out, right? But I, because I believe in order to stop the external conflicts, you first have to deal with the internal conflict. And my internal conflict at that time was just dealing with a lot of the verbal and physical abuse at the hands of my stepdad and my mother's boyfriend and also being bullied, right? So I think that we first have to deal with those internal conflicts before we can start dealing with those external conflicts. And we really have to uh, get deep within the young men and women who are impacted by violence. And I think that it starts with family transformation, right? Because as you just asked me that sometimes it's a generational thing, right? My grandfather was part of, so some of the young men that we work with, their dads and their moms were also impacted by the gang culture. So that's why I believe that a family focused, uh, a family focused and a family centered uh, wraparound services and prevention. I think that's where we have to start at. Okay. Um, would you say something about what's related to the nature of the violence that you're seeing in Chicago. And I'm assuming that things will be very similar for other cities. It's recent trends and what's going on now with-, with Yeah. Now? <laughs> so Chicago, you know, and I'm glad that you put it that way because sometimes we throw numbers around a lot and, and, and you know, these are not numbers. These are people who have unfortunately lost their lives or have been shot due to gang violence. But, you know, just last year, we had a 850 homicides with over four, with over, with over 4,500 people that were shot. Um, and 60% of those shootings and homicide came from 15 communities. And we know that majority of the time that poverty and violence, they kind of trend together. So those are the trends that we're also seeing. And also in Chicago, we have about 2,000 different groups of cliques uh, so that's 2,000 different groups that are in constant conflict with one another. And the other trend that we're seeing is that they're getting significantly younger, right? And a lot of the conflicts that we're seeing are really coming from or being um, uh, um, projected more by social media. Okay. Um, we know there's this phenomenon that we call here the hybrid gangs, which has law enforcement very concerned. These are young people, not in traditional gangs, but associated usually based on high school affiliation. Um, and law enforcement is concerned because it seems like sometimes these folks don't think. What's going on there? Who, who are these youngsters? They are young people that are all making bad decisions. I believe wholeheartedly that no one comes out of the womb violent unless there's something mentally or spiritually wrong with them, right? So we know, we know that violence is something that's learned, right? 
And so we have to unlearn some of that learned behavior. And unfortunately, the younger they, the younger they are, the harder it is to kind of break that because uh, when you're of such a young age, you don't have a whole lot of life lessons, if that makes sense, right? And so what we try to do is try to instill with these young men and women more to live for than to die for. And I don't know if you're having that in, in Houston, but we're also having this drug epidemic and it's starting with the young folks, you know, using uh, pills such as ecstasy and Percocet. So you're talking about all of these drug infusions on top of a whole lot of trauma with these young men and women, which makes them extremely violent and erratical. And you know that when we were younger, we were more sporadic, you know, just in the way that we live. So just think about the drug use on top of the trauma with the uh, with, with the younger age. Okay. Um, you also mentioned the role of social media. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to elaborate a little bit about what, what do you think the impact of the social media is having on these uh, young people and gangs? Yeah, we call it clickbait and, you know, living for clout. And we really have to change the culture and the dynamic of what people are getting uh, clicks for, if that makes sense, clicks and likes. So unfortunately here in Chicago, the most popular people are the ones who have the most bodies, right? Meaning the ones who have shot the most people are becoming the most uh, influential as it relates to social media. So how do we change that dynamic? How do we change that being the smartest person in the class is now more acceptable and is the person that's getting the more likes? So I think that's something that we as a society, we have to do better at. We've had several meetings you know, with the Facebooks and the Instagrams, just really trying to see how can we have a better impact once we see that a post or a video is made that we believe can impact the violence in those communities, right? And we're having some leeway, but as you know, not a whole lot. Um, and so again, we're, we're thinking about 60% of the violence actually is, is coming from social media as it relates to the TikTok videos, the Twitter fingers, uh, Facebook, and all of that. So how can we stop glorifying the gangster, if you will, and start putting more influence, influences on those who we feel are productive members of society? Um, if we could go back for a moment to what you mentioned about young people learning, being miseducated about responding to things violently. How do we try to counter that? Those of us working in the school system or who come in contact with young people before it gets to a really dangerous point? Oh, we have to go to the root cause of why some of these young folks are acting up, some of the things that I said uh, before. And then we also have to find out what are their triggers and what triggers them, right? Mm -hmm. And what uh, what are, what is their why? Again, when they're so young, it's hard to really bring out their why. Like for me, once I got older, my why was my son, right? A lot of these young men and women have not even figured out their why yet. So how do we infuse a, a why into them to look and to do things differently, right? And I think we have to give them more exposure to different things other than what they're seeing in some of their communities, right? When I don't, I, I need to come to, to Texas more to really see what it's like. But in Chicago, we really have two Chicago's, right? You have the downtown Chicago, then you have the west and south side of Chicago, and they look a lot different from each other, right? Mm -hmm. You have uh, rundown communities, boarded up homes in some of the communities that I work in. But then when you go downtown, you have the Magnificent Mile, right? And so how do we get these young men and women to see different? And I believe once they see different and start feeling different, then ironically, they start to do different. That it's sounds right on point. It does. Exposure. Go yeah. ahead, Doc. We do have another question here for you, uh, sir. What is your message to that teenage Black male that's being raised by a single parent, uh, faced with decisions and just trying to find his way? <laughs> that they can do it. And we have to give them what we call pro-social networks, which a lot of them don't have. And that's a network of people 
that they can count on to steer them in the right direction, right? And I tell people all the time, I'm not anti-gang, I'm anti-violence, right? We have to change the dynamics of the groups that these young men and women are running with, right? Because the majority of of groups are not bad. When you think I'm a member of Omega Zai Five, people might think that's bad <laughs> to a certain degree, but we're we're a pro-social group, right? And some may even consider us a gang, right? But we 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 don't move in, in the way that most gangs move violently. So I think that we have to get out of the mindset that we have to destroy the gang itself and look more to how do we change the mindset of those individuals that are that are running around in what we call these uh, pro-social networks. Okay, violence interruption is a buzzword now. Um, <laughs> tell us about violence interruption and what you're engaged in that goes beyond violence interruption. Yeah. So violence interruption means that you're interrupting the violence while it's happening or doing the stages of the violence. Um, and so it's, it's more of a intervention mechanism, if you will. And so we think that, and I think that there's a two-pronged thing. We have to do violence intervention as well as prevention on the front end, right? Both of these have to go together simultaneously because what happens is if, if you're just doing a violence intervention approach, then what happens is, is that you have what we call replacement killers. As soon as you have a young man, right, that has died or is killing, and you, haven't, and you have not prevented the next one from coming in, then that cycle of violence just continues. Okay, now talk about going beyond, beyond that. Um, you're involved in helping persons to get employment. What, what do policymakers need to do if they want to see some long-term impact? open up the pocketbook first, right? <laughs> you know, we, we know that, you know, we have to have resources, right? And we have to have what we call relentless engagement, right? But we also know that programs within themselves, they don't change the way that young men and women feel or act. It's the relationships, right? We know that relationships is actually what changes the young men and women that we work with. So the policymakers have to understand that this is not a quick fix problem, right? We're talking about generations that we were talking about uh, of, of systematic uh, injustices that have happened in these urban communities, right? So a lot of times they think, hey, they're always looking at the numbers. What were the numbers like last year compared to this year? And things are not just going to change overnight. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I try to push, especially when I'm talking to policymakers, because, again, they're just they're usually just going to looking at numbers. Right. And, and, and it's not it's not an overnight fix and it's not a one size fits all type of problem because we have to individualize these young men and women. So hopefully if we can get to them on an individual basis, it'll change the dynamics of the group that they're working with. And once we change the individual, it leads to the group dynamics changing, which hopefully, which hopefully will lead to uh, community and neighborhood suppression as it relates to uh, gun violence. Okay, you talked about dealing with the entire family. And we have a saying in, in the juvenile justice counseling world that sometimes the person who's tagged the juvenile delinquent is the most sane person in the whole family. So what areas do we need to focus on? And, and here's where the question is coming from. Houston is about to spend quite a bit of money. And here's hoping that there's attention to domestic violence. Um, there's attention to mental health. But what, what are we missing? I think all of those things are very important, but it definitely has to be a family integrated approach. Because like you said, <laughs> if we're doing all that we can when we uh, try to provide these services to the young men and women and they're going home to a dysfunctional family, then we're just starting all over <laughs> from, from the beginning all over again. So it has to be a family integrated approach and we have to really work with the whole family and social network, whether that's the friend, the cousin who he looks up to, the mom who may have her own problems. So we have to work with all of them at the same time so they can all walk side by side with one another. That's related okay. to another question. You, uh, you're focusing on the family and it sounds like this is a, 
essential point. Uh, the question is asking about what do you say to the father that's left the home abandoning his black son just to avoid the mother or just to avoid that home situation? We see a lot of that and, mm -hmm. and, and, we, and we have to uh, wrap our hands and arms around those young men, especially those who want to see and do differently. I think that when, when, when the doctor was talking about those entry points of violence, we know that unfortunately, usually the entry point of violence for a lot of the young men and women that we work with is domestic violence, right? That's usually where it starts at. And how can we provide those services to those young men, especially those who want to do something different, right? We have to, we have to create circles and we have to create agency to really help those young men to navigate them to be able to do the right thing, right? And we also have to have services for the young women as well. Seeing an uptick in the women being more violent and a lot of the violence is trending, uh, if you will, starting from some of the relationships with the young women. I definitely agree with that point. We've, we've definitely seen that. Susan, any questions? Yeah. Yes, I have uh, some questions that have come through the Q&A. Uh, so one question is, would you say that age or maturity has an impact on when a person, a child, adult, teen starts to make a change and recognizes that they need to change? So is, is there a point in terms of age or maturity, would you say, where it's sort of, um, you talked about, uh, kind of a pivotal point in terms of making that change? Yes and no. I, I think I'm on a program that I could be real frank and I'm sure some of Absolutely. you have ran across, ran across some people that we just call some old fools, right? <laughs> and so yes and no, right? Some people do what we call, they age out of, of the street culture, right? They just age out like, because uh, a 40 year old, don't or shouldn't have the same things in common with a 17 or 18 year old or a 30 year old, right? So what we have, our commonalities just start to be different, right? But what we're seeing is, is that the common denominator, the common denominator for a lot of these young and older men and women that are in these groups is the violence, right? That's what's the common denominator that keeps them, that keeps the common bond between them. But some folks do age out, some folks do mature at a different, at a different level. Uh, and, and you guys are probably more better at it or more knowledgeable at it than me to know that the brain really don't fully develop in a man until he's 20 something plus years old, if that makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, okay, another question is, it seems like a running theme in your answers is developing the ability to project or see ourselves in the future. How can we do this when poor, minority communities and the schools in those communities continue to be marginalized? How can kids see their future in highly multiple marginalized circumstances? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and, and, the doctor, and the doctor spoke on earlier, we have to really push those people who are in, in what we consider high places to get our communities to, to look better and to feel better and to thrive better, right? And so for me, one of the things that always keep me going is when I think about our ancestors and I know that we're standing on the shoulders of them and a lot of them were marginalized as well. And they went through what we call the epitome of poverty, right? But a lot of them overcame and were okay. And a lot of them are the reason why we're here today and able to push forward. So I think those are some of the things that we, we have to understand and thrive on and hope, you know, that we could see a better future. Um, related, related to that uh, response, uh, you talked about some things that I think many people would interpret as long-term solutions, changing the community. Um, what are some of the more short-term things that we can do? For example, if we are dealing with a nine-year-old Curtis Toller, what does nine-year-old Curtis Toller need to say, hey, I'm going in this other direction? 
<laughs> the nine-year-old Curtis, <laughs> first of all, you know, needed someone to first of all recognize that I was going through something when I showed up somewhere acting differently, right? Like when I when I went to school, I can remember, uh, man, it's a good memory. I guess it was a really good teacher. I had a first grade teacher. Her name was Miss Feeney, right? And she would just always ask me, how is everything going? And I wouldn't open up to her, but just her asking me that question started to resonate to me that Miss Feeney cared, right? So having those people to, to be able to ask those questions to a young Curtis or to a young whoever it is uh, that they may feel is going through something and being comfortable enough to go down that road and have those conversations, right? Okay, that sounds very good. Very, very good on point. Uh, Susan? Uh, oh, and one of the other things while, 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 okay. while, we're, while we're talking about this, so we're talking about the nine-year-old Curtis, and then we're also talking about the 16 or 17-year-old Curtis who found his mom dead in the, in the garage, right? And when I think about that, uh, a counselor or a clinician didn't show up at my door knowing that I had went through this traumatic experience, right? And I just always wonder what if someone had intervened then, right? Would my life trajectory had it turned out differently? Absolutely. Very, oh, very yeah. much on point. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have another question. Um, so how do we teach the past in the current climate without pessimism towards the future? That's the first part of the question, then I'll give you the second part. <laughs> That's a, that's a great question. I wish you ever asked that question. I'm sure they have some thoughts about it. But reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram. Oh, man. It's... So, you, so you deal with young people, and I deal with young folks all the time, right? And the thing that we're always trying to instill and to come up with ways is to come up with a way to teach our past to make it impactful without it being corny. Right. <laughs> and I'm an older man, so maybe the younger person that asked that question can help us figure out some of those some of those answers. Yeah, that is that's a tricky thing is how do you do that so that it has a kind of impact that you want so they can see, okay, there is I have a future. So the second part of this question is what kinds of answers would you give to a young person? to teach them to see their future more positively? Oh, so I go back to, to, that, to that older man who was on the bus with me, right? He mm -hmm. didn't know me from a can of paint, but he at least took the time out to have that conversation with me uh, and didn't know, I'm sure that he didn't know that it would have the impact on my life that it did or it does today because it gave me the foresight to at least go back and to see what he was saying, right? I had heard about, you know, all the, you know, the Rosa Parks and the civil rights movement and the Dr. King, and I, I've heard about that. But he actually took the time out amongst me being a gang leader to pull me to the side, being unafraid to really have that conversation with me, right? And that was a seed that was planted, but it took years down the line for it to be fertilized, but it happened, right? And so for us to really be able and not to be afraid of young folks, right? To be able to want to have those conversations with them because the change is not gonna come from us. We're just gonna help guide the change. The change is gonna come from these young brothers and sisters who are in these communities that, that have to impact the change that we wanna see. So you've, you've given something here today, the, meaning a message that all of us can do something. All of us can do something. We can pay attention to the young people around us. We can ask some questions. We can give some words of encouragement. We can help them to see themselves in ways that they're probably not thinking. 
So value in every human being. And all right. So, so what are any advice for how not to do this, uh, how not to do this or how to do this incorrectly? What do young people not want to hear? <laughs> so uh, a lot of people, a lot of, especially a lot of young folks, right? Uh, don't want to hear the traditional I've already did it so you don't have to do it right which in hindsight like if I run and hit my head on the wall you shouldn't have to go and hit your head on the wall also right but how do we close the gap without making them feel less than if that makes sense right because they're, they're how do we close the age gap without making them feel less than um and we have to do a lot of more listening and a lot less talking, right? Again, I know that the change is gonna have to come from them. And we just, again, have to be the guides to give them the instruction to get to a better place. So I think one of the first things that we have to do is to listen a lot more and believe what they're saying. I had, uh, we just had a situation where a young man here in Chicago was at one of our programs and he was uh, telling an instructor, he was like, uh, I really don't feel safe. There's some, like, there could be, you know, some money or something on my head, right? And the instructor took that seriously and had the conversation with the young man and told him not to come for a little while. But again, relationships change the way that people feel. So there was this dynamic relationship at this particular program that the young man uh, was going to. And so then he, you know, let his guards down and felt safe. And unfortunately, he was killed. But again, we have to listen to what the young men and women are telling us. And then after we listen to them, we have to go into our quiet spaces with one another, then find out the best ways for us to go forward and then to take action on what has been told to us. Any word for those who are leaders in law enforcement in terms of things <laughs> that they might do better? Um, and, and let me tell you where that question is coming from. One of the things that we're doing with money is putting more officers in those pockets of the cities where it seems there's more violence than in other areas. So for those officers, the law enforcement leaders and the people going out to these pockets, what's the word? The first thing that I would, you know, that I would tell them is that we can't arrest our way out of these problems, right? Because we've tried that hand in hand, I mean, time and time again, and that doesn't work, right? We have to change the mindset of these young men and women who are engaged in this violence. And what I mean by we can't lock arrest our way out of the problem is, is that if I'm a young man that's highly engaged in the violence and you just lock me up, right, and you haven't change the mindset of my younger brother or cousin or my friend that's closest to me, then he's just going to take my place, right? So we have to uh, give, give the officers the, 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 the wherewithal and the mindset to know that they just can't arrest their way out of this problem. And to really be more engaged in the community, right? I'm sure that you faced it there in Houston is that there's a distrust or a mistrust between community and, and, and law enforcement, right? And how do you gain that trust back is something that we're trying to work on and there's different strategies for that because they have to see people for who they are. They are human beings at first, right? First and foremost, we are all human beings. And once I believe that the officers are able to see that, then they'll start reacting differently. And we also have to have officers from the communities working in the community, right? <laughs> because that was the thing that actually missing here in Chicago. You have folks coming from the north side working in these west side dist districts, and they don't, they have a different approach. They have a different theory of how to police because they don't have a clue as to what's going on in these particular communities. Very much on point. And if law enforcement officers indeed build those relationships, it should make their jobs simpler. Because when people trust in minority communities, people will talk to the officers because folks who live in these communities, they don't want them, they don't want the mess either. So very, very true. I see more questions popping up. Susan? All right. Yes. Uh, there is a question from um, Chief Hardy, uh, juvenile probation. 
uh, he, is, he or she states that one of their main goals is to reduce recidivism in youth. His first, his or her first option is to utilize an evidence-based counseling. Then if the youth continues to violate, he's forced to detain or perhaps placed in a facility for a long period of time. If you were in his shoes, what would you recommend his or her department to address first to reduce recidivism? Oh, the first thing that I would address is, is we're talking about recidivism. So that means that someone who is, uh, who's gotten out and gone back more than once, right? So I think the mm -hmm. first thing that we have to, to work on is if they are uh, being, or if they are reoffenders, what's happening while they're in the institution? <laughs> What, what's actually, uh, are they actually just, is it actually just the holding place or, or they're actually there or is there actually something there in place that's changing the mindset, right? And I know that the, the, that the parole or the probation officer is in kind of a catch-22 situation where they want to do the right thing. They don't want to keep arresting folks. But I think that they have to uh, engage with, with more community agencies, right? to find that community partner that they feel would be a good match that is really, uh, that has real integrity on changing the mindset of what the young men and women are doing. And I think, you know, we have to, again, have a holistic approach. I think when we talk about the family dynamics, I believe that the, that the young officer, not the young officer, but the officer has to work again with the whole social and family system around that young man and woman to try to keep them from reoffending. Uh, if I may, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh, if I may, may jump in with this. In Texas, we have some young people, uh, Curtis, who are in the system, and folks don't know what to do with them. Uh, these are young people who will beat up staff, etc. Um, in Texas, we try to hold in a residential facility only the most serious. Any thoughts about that crowd? Well, so those are the people who I, who I work with, right? We call them the acutely at risk to shoot or be shot or to act out violently. Mm -hmm. And again, and it, and it sounds cliche, right? Because we hear it all the time that hurt people hurt people, but I also believe that healed people can heal people. So we have to start unpacking all of the layers, whether it's the substance abuse, whether it's all the traumatic experiences that this young man or woman, woman has gone through, whether it's the music that they're listening to, we have to unpack all of this and have those conversations. And then we have to have a trauma-informed care approach with these young people who are extremely violent, right? To get to the root cause of why they're acting the way that they do. But until we get to the root cause and try to, and I don't mean from a prescriptive point of view, necessarily by medication, but I mean, until we get a real diagnosis of why these young men and women are acting out, then they'll just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So it's, so, so we do need facilities sometimes, and it can be a long-term process, but if I'm hearing you correctly, we shouldn't give up. We try piece by piece to get behind piece by those piece. We can't give up. We, we can't give up because I think all the time, right? What if someone had a gave, gave up on me, then I wouldn't be the Curtis Toler of today that's trying to help the young men and women. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm I am here, right? Is because I had people that believed in me more than I believed in myself. Okay. Um, Susan, I know you have questions. Go ahead. I do. Um, what kind of secondary investments should we be making in our communities, such as art, ethnic art, interactive history, et cetera? That's good. That, that, that's really good, right? Because we really have to think outside of the box because what we're noticing is that a lot of the, a lot of the traditional things that we're doing 
it's just not working. It's just not working anymore. And again, we have to ask the young men and women who are engaged in the violence, what is it that, that they want that they think will impact them to think and act different? Okay. Um, Susan, um, go ahead. Yep. A few more questions here. Uh, how old were you when you turned your life around and what made you change? What was the kind of factor that precipitated your change? Oh, I was an old fool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I, when I, I didn't, you know, man, I didn't totally change. I mean, until 30. <laughs> I mean, to, to say that I was uh, fully removed from the gang and street culture around 30 years old, actually. You know what I mean? I wasn't yeah. uh, highly engaged in the violence, in the violent part of, part of it, but I was still engaged, right? And I had convinced myself, and a lot of times, we, we, you know, a lot of times folks that's actually involved in, in the criminal life, we tell these lies to ourselves that I'm doing it for my family, right? I'm, you know, I'm doing this to keep my family afloat. But then when I think back on it, I didn't have to have five cars and three houses, right? You only could drive one car at a time, right? So I was actually using my family as a scapegoat to keep doing the nonsense that I was, that I was doing. Uh, and, and like I said, there was, a, there, was, there was certain, a few different trans, transition points in my life. The, one, the first one was my, was my son. And then um, I had stopped. I had did what we call, you know, cold turkey, right, as it relates to uh, the street culture. Um, but I was still trying to, to live the life or to keep this facade of who I used to be, right? And I had, a, I had bills, I had a lot of bills. I still remember my bills. My bills a month were $9,237, right? And so, Homes, homes were being put in foreclosure. Cars were being repossessed. So now I'm just down to one car, one place, right? And so here come that devil, right? <laughs> you can get back out there, you know, just give it one more run. And uh, I contemplated and I fought with myself for a long time. And then this is when he shows himself, right? My cousin shows up at my house and he's just bought the new S550 Benz. Yeah, I think it was S550. Yeah, Ben. And he was like, cuz, we miss you. But things just not the same without you being here. And I'm thinking to myself, ooh, I've been waiting on you to show up, right? <laughs> and so fortunately, uh, I thought about, you know, everything that I had said that I was doing it for. And at that particular time, the, identi the identity of me being a father superseded the identity of me being a drug dealer and a gang leader, right? And so I told my cousin, I was like, man, I'm done. And he said, man, you're a better man than me. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm just ready and you're not. Um, and that weekend he was kidnapped and killed. So from that, from that point on, I knew that I had made the right decision. Right. Okay. Yeah, I um, I do have another yes, go ahead. Uh, for those individuals who are choosing to disengage or leave the gang, but remain in the community, what can be done to increase their safety? And maybe that was your case or not, I'm not sure. They want to leave, yeah. but stay in the community. So that's where the neighborhood suppression has to come in, right? Because especially when you think about these young men and women that's highly involved in gun conflict here in Chicago, uh, just because you change don't mean that the people that you've been in opposition to all of these years have changed, right? And so until we change the, co the community dynamic, then it's hard for young folks to really do something different. And so that's one of the things that I work hard on and we call those non-aggression agreements, right? And for those young men and women who come to us and say that they want to change and they're involved in a group, first, we try to change the mindset of the entire group, which usually don't happen. We only change the mindset of a few of them in that group. And then we find out 
who the group, quote unquote, their ops are or their rivals are. And we reach out to them as well, right? So we have these conversations with both of the groups who who in who are in this violent conflict, and we we sit them down and we try to come up with what we call a non-aggression agreement, right? And a non-aggression agreement is really something from a harm reduction model. And what we're saying is, we know that you've been engaged in these violent conf in these in this violent conflict for however amount of time, and there's probably been casualties on both sides, right? Can we come to an agreement or a point? that if you stay over there and the other guy is still over there for a period of time, you won't play what we call offense. So you won't go into these other communities seeking out these young men and women to shoot them. And once they agree to that, hopefully that'll give us enough time to work with both of the groups to hopefully come up with what we call a peace treaty from those non-aggression agreements. Okay, Susan, uh, another question? Yes. Um, what age range would you say is the most effective time to change the negative direction of the youth? Or is there a, is there a good age? <laughs> when I think about the young Curtis, 10, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because what we're noticing, what we're noticing, right, is that the cycles of violence are get, it's getting younger and younger. Like when you, when you, me, like when I'm looking at all of these, we have this carjacking epidemic that's going on here in Chicago, right? And it's really out of control, right? There are about 700 or more um, carjacking. Um, and the ages range from like 11 to 16, right? So you, and the carjacking, usually there's a weapon involved. And as we were talking earlier, that the younger you are, the more spontaneous you are. Uh, and unfortunately, that's leading to... Uh, people being killed during these carjackings by these younger folks, right? And so I think, I think the prevention has to start at a young age, right? Especially when you talk about those young men and women who are fortunately living in these urban communities that are suffering from the plagues of, of poverty, right? We have to start at a young age because we have to, again, like I said earlier, we have to stop the replacement killers or the replacement shooters or the replacement stealers, right? And so that starts at a young age because uh, most of them have someone that they look up to and if that person that they look up to is not a positive role model and influence, then they're gonna fall right in their footsteps. Similarly, um, okay, talking about in early intervention, how would we address building resilience in the communities and families? So you've, you've come back again and again to the family focus, and that sounds like that is essential. Um, how do we build resilience in families and in communities so that we can help build these young people up? We have to go back into those communities and really find those champions that I know that are still there, right? Everyone hasn't moved out of the community that really has a vested interest in that community. In that community, And I always go back and I think about my grandmother, who was one of those champions, um, who, uh, you know, just give a quick story. She came to, to, my, to my grandma eighth grade class and she whooped me and a young man. And I'm not saying that violence is the key. I'm just saying those champions that she came to the school and, you know, had a real conversation with me and the young man that I was into, that I had a, had a problem with, right? And she, uh, she was a champion of the block, even though, you know, there's this misnomer that, uh, that all people, that majority of the people who do a lot of bad things come from a broken home. I did come from a broken home. I had a lot of undiagnosed trauma, but I also had a grandmother who loved me dearly and tried to do the very best that she could with me. And I just made those choices to do something different because I didn't have, because I had all of those undiagnosed traumas. But we have to go back into the community and we have to build those champions out and give them the resources that's needed for them to try to have an impact. Because I believe that every young man and young woman has at least one person that they really look up to and respect regardless of how they act. And I found that to be true, right? Even if we have to make that person into existence. Okay. Yep, sir. Okay. So Susan, we are almost at the hour. 
thank you. You've given us, uh, Mr. Curtis Toller, a lot to think about. If I heard correctly, you mentioned that we need to pay attention to young people. We need to start early. Not be afraid to intervene, ask questions, give some words of advice. I heard you talk about some long-term things that we need to do. We need to invest in the communities, see that young people are educated, that they have job opportunities, that they have a good environment. Um, you mentioned going back to individual relationships that everybody has at least that one person, or we should see to it that they have at least that one person that they look up to who can be a source of support. Uh, in terms of some short-term things that we can do um, on the individual level, besides intervening, you talked about law enforcement, understanding the communities, being from the communities, spending time getting to know young people in the communities. I heard you also say that uh, we shouldn't be in a hurry to lock people up. Uh, because the impact of locking up too many people can lead to some negative socializations. Uh, but you did say that there are some folks who need to be locked up, not in those exact words, but they need to be locked up until we deal with their layers to understand whatever trauma or substance abuse or whatever is going on that makes them act in a certain kind of way. So we do have those folks, but I think you would agree with me that most individuals should be served because you said, use the community resources, find those community partners who can work with young people. You also mentioned the importance of family, that you could do as much work as possible with the individual, but if he or she goes back to a dysfunctional family, that's not a formula for success. So we need to pay attention to family. And in terms of violence, you talked about people being miseducated as they're growing up about dealing with things in a violent way. And so we need to address that miseducation. And we're not going to know who those folks are unless we engage with our young people to find out, you know, why, why do people think that violence is the way that you deal with the situation? Um, something that we didn't touch on, guns. And, and we're almost out of time, but say something about guns. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the, and that's the elephant in the, that seems to always be in the room when I have these conversations with not only policymakers, but law enforcement, right? Is that, you know, people don't kill people, guns kill people, right? And how is that there's this big influx of guns, especially into the urban communities that are so accessible to get to. A young man or woman can get a gun before they can get a computer, right? It's just become that accessible, right? And so I had a, and I'll, and I'll stop here, I had a conversation, I was on a plane with a family from New Zealand, and we were just talking, and you know, unfortunately, Chicago has become the poster child for violence, and they were asking me, it's really bad out there, and people are getting shot. And I was like, you know, people have guns and get shot, you know, pretty much everywhere. This is my, you know, my conversation with them. And they was like, no. And I was like, what do you mean? No, they was like the first time that we saw a gun was in a museum and on TV. Mm -hmm. And so we <laughs> began to have this dialect. So I just started to think, what would these urban communities look like if there weren't any guns? And we'll stop there because you're in Texas. So um, <laughs> uh, the, the other thing that you said that I, I want to repeat um, you mentioned that a lot of violence for people is tied to domestic violence. And that's part mm -hmm. of the miseducation, domestic violence. So paying attention to that so that we have healthy families is a long-term way of dealing with our violence problem. Mr. Curtis Toller, you have given us a lot to think about and we are delighted that you are here. Any closing words? Thank you for having me. And I can't wait till this, uh, this pandemic is gone so I can come and talk to you guys in person. I'd love to come down and we can go into some of these communities and talk to some of the young folks. All right, you've got an open invitation. Thank you so much. On behalf Thank of the Texas so Juvenile Crime Prevention Center and Prairie View, have a good day.
and we look forward to success in dealing with our violence problems. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me. Thank you for having me.